Good afternoon. Uh, I almost said good evening. I was walking across the campus and I was thinking, you know, the end of February is the most dismal part of the entire year. Uh, I'm sure some places the sun is shining and you can see pineapple on the beach, but not here. Um, the, the, uh, this event is part of a series named after a Brooklyn College faculty member, a uh, member of the English department, who in 1952, I think, or 53, was forced to resign in the midst of the McCarthy hysteria over communists. Um, not a little bit unlike the Donald Trump hysteria over Muslims. Uh, but. But even worse, because it, it, it had gone on for a long time and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And there were congressional committees that devoted themselves to um, doing a, 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 kind, a kind of public ritual of shaming that is, was, even as a, I was a little kid then, but I, it was just so horrible to watch. They would take people who had been belonged to liberal organizations in the 1930s when the country was very much more liberal than it was in the 1950s. And they would ask them in public, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And sometimes they would refuse to answer on grounds that it might tend to incriminate them. Sometimes they wouldn't. And they would also ask them if they knew anyone else who had done this. If these people were like famous actors and they knew actors who had belonged to, uh, apparently, I have not heard of them, but well-known uh, leftist groups in Hollywood in the 1930s. They were supposed to report their names. And it got to be pretty scary. And it got to the point where Brooklyn College, um, and a lot of other places, forced members of its faculty, people with tenure and academic entitlement with a long and noble history, forced them to resign their positions or actually fired them outright. Um, submitted them to all kinds of public humiliation. Lots of them couldn't get jobs for a long time afterwards. There were at least 10 screenwriters in Hollywood who were blacklisted and were no longer able to work in Hollywood. Well, in 1987, the Wolf Institute, which was then called the Humanities Institute, sponsored a two-day conference on McCarthyism. And in this conference, there was a whole half a day devoted to McCarthyism at Brooklyn College, which was a wonderful thing. Uh, wonderful innovation, which we owe to Sharon Zucken, professor of sociology. We're still teaching here, terrific teacher. Um, one of the people who spoke was Fred Ewan, who was at this point 87 years old. He um, had never found another job after 1952. He survived by teaching private courses, writing books, um, and who knows how else. Great difficulty. And one of the people in the audience was a Brooklyn College alumnus who happened to have been his nephew. And when Ewan was still teaching here, his nephew, Herbert Kurz, used to commute from King's Highway and someplace uh, to say, uh, sometimes walking to save the dime car fare was really broke. But by 1987, he was a multi-zillionaire, or anyway. And two days after the conference, we got a letter from him, including a check for $100,000 to endow a, a biannual lecture or conference on civil liberties. And at first, we were a little puzzled because we hadn't really thought of that as a specialty of ours, but it became a specialty of ours. And we've never, ever, 
had to cancel this lecture or this series for the lack of something to talk about. Civil liberties are always under attack. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Mustafa Bayoumi, my colleague in the English department, for organizing this event. Uh, our speakers are Sarah Ali, a graduating senior in the Macaulay Honors Program here at Brooklyn College, and president of Brooklyn College's Students for Justice in Palestine, having served on its board for four years. Ramzi Kassim is associate professor of law at the City University of New York, where he directs the Immigrant and Non-Citizen Rights Clinic and supervises the Creating Law Enforcement Accountability and Responsibility CLEAR project, which primarily aims to address the legal needs of Muslim, Arab, South Asian, and other communities in the New York City area that are particularly affected by national security and counterterrorism policies and practices. Aviva Stahl, an independent journalist who writes about prisons, national security, and immigration detention. Uh, Rabia As Asin, is that right? Yes. Asin Tarar is a graduate student at Columbia University pursuing a master's degree in Middle Eastern, Southeastern, and African studies. And I'd like to say before closing that that list uh, is a sign that civil liberties still exist in the city of New York. And uh, long may they thrive. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Professor Viscuzzi. This is going to be a very exciting panel. I think we should dive right into it. But before we do, let me just mention one other thing, which is this is part of the Frederick Ewan uh, lecture series on civil liberties and academic freedom, as Professor Viscuzzi was just saying. There'll be another event, which is on March 22nd, right? March 22nd at 11 a.m. We are screening the film Terror, which is the T in parentheses. I believe actually, unbeknownst, it was a surprise, I think, even to the filmmaker, but it screened last, last night on uh, Independent Lens. It's a very, very worthwhile film to see. Uh, terror with the T in the parentheses, so it's like t error. You know, you can see what's going on there. Um, Anyway, and so uh, that film will be screened at 11 with the filmmaker present, uh, one of two filmmakers for the film. Um, she'll come and she'll then discuss the film and talk about the questions it raises. Uh, and um, lunch will also be served at that event. So uh, mark your calendars, March 22nd, 11 a.m. But turning to today's event, uh, I, I don't know how many of you are aware of the facts of the New York City Police Department uh, and its infiltration of CUNY campuses in particular with regards to national security policies, the war on terror investigations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. raises many different issues also not only about civil liberties but also fundamental issues about our own academic freedom, about what are the, uh, what are the times and places when uh, if and when the police are able and, and should be allowed to come onto our campuses. Uh, and this is not an academic question. We know that it's not an academic question, but it's a very real question. Not that academics is not real. But it's a, it's a very real question because we now, we have quite a bit of evidence about this happening. Uh, this is something that if you are part of the uh, uh, Muslim communities in New York City, I think that you've suspected that these sorts of things have been going on for quite a while. Uh, we actually now have a lot of confirmation of our suspicions. Uh, perhaps that began um, in a formal way, I guess, uh, with a 2011 series that began with the Associated Press talking about uh, the demographics unit, a whole wing of the, department, the police department that was set up to monitor the sort of blanket surveillance of the Muslim communities here in New York City and even beyond this, the, uh, the borders of the city. And that also included, those, in, those revelations also included uh, revelations that the police were also on our campuses. And then just this past fall, in October, we have even more uh, evidence for it. And there was a, a, a series of articles that uh, Aviva Stahl, who at the end of the, uh, the table, this gender segregated table, which is not gender segregated <laughs> on purpose, 
uh, at the end of the table, wrote a, a, a very good series of articles um, about the fact that there had been a woman here on campus for several years, in fact, for several years, who turned out to be an undercover police officer. And of course, we should also note the difference between a police officer who's working undercover versus somebody who's an informant working with the police. And so this is even more part of the system of the uh, police department, if it's a police officer who's here on campus. Uh, let me read you a little bit about, uh, uh, about this woman who, she went by the name of Mel, right, on campus. And um, this is from the article that, uh, that Aviva wrote. So, so she writes, at first Mel seemed warm and friendly, if a bit eager. She was very nice, very charming, said Cherie, who studied psychology at Brooklyn College and now works as a psychotherapist. She wanted to do everything with us. Mel told the Islamic Society women that she was a recent Rutgers College graduate who had grown up in Queens. She said that she was of Turkish descent and had been born into a Muslim but non-practicing family. The women active in Brooklyn College's Islamic Society were diverse. They majored in women's studies, psychology, pre-med and political science, hung out with friends, crushed on boys, and nurtured their newfound political consciousness. They were coming of age in a city scarred by 9-11, and although their Muslim identity did not define them, it shaped their everyday lives. But they knew their behavior was being scrutinized by the authorities. After 9-11, both the NYPD and the FBI revamped their approach to terrorism investigations and began operating under a policy of preventive prosecution, in an internal document from 2007, the NYPD identified particular indicators of radicalization, such as wearing as traditional Islamic clothing, giving up drinking or smoking, or becoming involved in social activism. In the NYPD's model of measuring threats, which have since been broadly criticized, young people were a key target. Shireen, then 25, and a close friend, Faiza, were responsible for introducing new converts like Mel to the basic tenets of Islam. One day in early 2011, Mel asked Faiza to meet her on campus. Quote, Faiza told me afterward that Mel asked her some strange questions, like, what is all of this about jihad, Shireen recalled, and asking about people who do suicide bombing. For Shireen and Faiza, Mel's questions were a red flag. They suspected she was digging for information on the political beliefs of the Islamic Society members, possibly even pressing them to make incriminating statements. Okay, so that's from the first article that Aviva wrote about this. So I was hoping that we could begin uh, with Aviva talking about uh, the, the journalistic enterprise here that she was involved in and, and telling us where she got the idea for this, how, how the story, how she dug for the story, what the story means, what it means for her, etc. Sure. Hi, I'm Aviva. Um, so how did I get the story? I mean, I think, you know, like any, I just through um, having contacts in the community, um, who trusted me to write up the story. I feel like really lucky and privileged to have been able to tell the story of the women I met. Um, and I guess, I mean, have people, do people have a sense of Mel's presence on, on Brooklyn College campus, of what happened? Kind of. I mean, do you want me to just briefly summarize beyond what? Sure. Okay. So, right, so she shows up on campus in the spring of 2011, and the way she shows up, shows up on campus, I think, is important. Um, it was after an Islamic Society lecture, and students were outside, so she comes up to them and says she wants to take the Shahada, which is the testimony of faith. Um, and she does, and a group of young kind of female Muslim students welcome her. They, as Professor Bimi mentioned, they teach her how to pray, they welcome her into their community. Um, right away, almost immediately, a few students begin to suspect her because of what she says, um, you know, what is all this about jihad and the suicide bombings. Um, but also, you know, she was always able to attend events. She didn't seem to really have any other place to go, a job. Um, and I mean, some other students notice nothing. But like right away, some students kind of suspect her. Um, in April, in August 2011, the AP documents are released, and it's also reported that there'd been an undercover cop at Brooklyn College. And over that fall, students kind of get really worried and they seek out legal advice. So they go to CUNY Clear and they, they try to get guidance on what to do about the fact that they suspect someone at Brooklyn College. But they don't have any proof. So, you know, some students even try to Google her, Google her name, see if there's anything, if anything comes up. And like literally nothing shows up. It's pretty unusual to Google someone's name and have it like literally nothing show up. So the students are, are pretty worried. But you know, they also don't have any proof and that's fundamentally what people at CUNY Clear told them, which was that you know, if someone's an undercover cop, you're never gonna be able to prove it either way. It's kind of the point, right? 
Um, so they just kind of live with their doubt and also with what it means for them, like the kind of internal questions it brings up, like, am I paranoid? Am I imagining things? Is she just weird? And the kind of religious questions that come up too of the importance in Islam of welcoming converts, of making them feel comfortable, of teaching them, of making them feel like they're embraced in the community. Um, so over time, she gets really, really, kind of really, really uh, worms her, herself into the lives of some women. Um, she attends bridal showers. She goes to classes, religious classes with them. She goes to kind of social gatherings. She's even in someone's wedding as a, as a bridesmaid. So she's not like on the like on the outside of their life. She's really like has a re really intimate relationships with some of the women. Um, sort of time passes. Students graduate, but they keep seeing her around. Um, it sort of turns out we might address this later, but that you know Mel doesn't disappear off campus. That actually, in the spring of 2014 and the fall of 2015, um, some students set up a group called Unity. Maybe some of you were active in it. I don't know which was like a coalition of students of color, uh, various groups, kind of organizing, sharing information and strategies and events. And it turns out that Mel was at those meetings too, internal meetings, planning meetings. So that she wasn't just surveilling Muslim students, but she was going to kind of coalition of color groups that had like n very little at least to do with Islam. Um, in any case, in April 2015, uh, two Queens women are arrested on terrorism charges and it was kind of through those arrests that Brooklyn College women, who'd been way back in the day in 2011, realized that actually their suspicions from the beginning had been true, and that Mel actually was an undercover cop. And that this whole time, when they'd be kind of questioning themselves, am I wrong, am I paranoid? Should I be, should I be, should I be trusting her? Am I like being a bad Muslim for having all these questions about her? That they were actually right. Um, so I think just briefly, I just want to kind of talk about four things that for me are important about the story in kind of general terms. Um, the first is the extent that Mel, that Mel was willing to go to kind of worm her way into these women's lives um, and to gain their trust. So to take the Shahada, right, for that to be the moment that she enters into their lives, I think is really important. Um, and I think really heartbreaking that uh, people's trust would be undermined in that way. Um, the second is that the Brooklyn College students that I interviewed, they were politically active, they were politically aware, and when they had suspicions and concerns about what was happening, they sought legal advice, right? They went to the people who, they, went, they saw lawyers to try to get guidance on what to do, right? And, they, and that they were aware about what was happening in, in New York, right? They weren't like, they, they educated themselves about their rights and about what was happening with the NYPD. Um, the third is that uh, the kind of impact it had on their psychological well-being uh, and also on their community. So even though they were really well educated about what was happening and even though they sought legal advice, they still doubted themselves. They still didn't know if they were being paranoid. Um, and it caused a lot of mistrust between people, both like before and after when they found out that Mel actually was an undercover cop. Um, so informants and undercover cops really tear away at the fabric of Muslim community life and life at Brooklyn College too. Um, and the fourth thing I think that's important to talk about is the fact that like, what's actually most unusual about this story for me as a journalist is that like, they found out. Not so much that there was an undercover cop or that there was an informant there, but that they could find out and verify that there was. And you know, there are like thousands and thousands and thousands of informants living in, in Muslim communities and reporting information to the FBI or the NYPD. And there are also, I don't know how many cops, but presumably a fair number, um, but we don't know. And there, it's really impossible, unless there's reporting on it, to gain information about this. And I think, you know, maybe, maybe later we'll talk about the settlement, but with the NYPD settlement even, right, the only reason we know about the various kinds of undercover cops and informants and surveillance there's been in NYPD uh, in New York City is because there's been reporting on it where, people, where reporters came across the information pretty much by accident or through like a series of coincidences. Um, and I think that's just, just really important to keep that in mind um, as we talk about this. Great, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so uh, I think Rabia and Sarah, you actually knew Mel, yes? So do you want to maybe talk about these um, questions and also about what, what the impact is, do you think, on, uh, on academic freedom and on um, civil liberties? Um, so I, I did actually know Mel. I knew Mel. I uh, 
met her the first day that she, you know, in quotes, converted to Islam. Um, and, but prior to that, I was politically active on campus. I was what you would call, I guess, religiously active. I was active with the MSA, the Muslim Students Association. And I think the question um, that I'm often, I guess, asked is, when did you discover surveillance and how did you react to that? And I think for me, discovering the surveillance wasn't, it wasn't so much a discovery as, as, in, as much as it was a confirmation. And so prior to even meeting Mel, um, there were always these suspicions that the people that we surround ourselves with may not actually be who they say they are. Um, and that fear, even before college, was pretty much instilled in many of us. And so coming across converts and coming across, and that's not to vilify converts, of course not, but like to coming across people that we may not uh, be very, very familiar with um, is very scary sometimes. Because if you are someone who is politically active and align yourself with particular religious views, at least at you know, within New York City, it becomes like a, a, a reason to be targeted. And so when I, you know, uh, a few months into knowing Mel, I started suspecting her. And I, because of my sort of being bound by certain, uh, I guess you could say religious edicts, like we couldn't backbite. We couldn't talk about one another in, in, a, in a way that would cause suspicion. And so I didn't really know who to go to. I didn't know who to sort of, um, tell that, okay, I think I suspect somebody of being an informant or an undercover, and at the time I didn't really know the difference between the two, and I just assumed that she was somebody who generally wanted to be, or generally, genuinely was a Muslim, but who was, um, you know, talking to the NYPD about us, because one of the questions that she would kind of ask us, and that she was very present in our lives and didn't seem like she had a day job, and she was just always um, kind of like a leech on, uh, onto us, but as far as, um, as far as what it did to us, um, I think for me it was like twofold. One was that I would suspect others, and the second part was that I would, I almost feared that people suspected me of being an informer. And so this kind of like dual, uh, this dual uh, personality uh, in a way. Um, and so for me, um, you know, as far as like student activities were concerned, I remember when the 2011 reports came out, and this is like months into knowing Mel, um, I was also active with what was then the, um, Palestinian club of Brooklyn College or at Brooklyn College and so immediately I start cutting off ties I start cutting off any kind of student or club activity that I was involved in because I didn't know that if these people were you know strategically placing themselves in my in my social circles for the purposes of spying on me especially when it came to something politically charged or something religiously charged um, and I think oftentimes what we're told is well if you're not doing anything wrong there shouldn't be anything to fear um, but despite not doing anything wrong, despite you know living a very like, you know straight, clear, clean life, like it, there's this fear that people will take things what take what you say out of context. Um, and I think so for as far as academic freedom is concerned, just within the college uh, or within a classroom environment where you, you know this is the one time that in anyone's life really, if you go to college, you're, you're expected to sort of uh, come out of your comfort zone and start addressing ideas that may be, you know, uh, far-fetched or may not be, you know, within uh, what you're normally used to discussing. So you'll be discussing controversial ideas and you'll be talking about things that are, um, you know, problematic. Um, but when you go into, you know, a, a classroom environment or when you're talking to your peers or your professors and you have this fear that you cannot actually discuss certain ideas and to the point where you're monitoring what you're allowing yourself to think, it's such a stunting, debilitating uh, feeling to experience that you can't, as a Muslim, because of your Muslimness, because of your particular political views um, or ideas or things that you're interested in, it may not even be solidified views that you actually adhere to, but just your realm of interest, because of those particular things, you become a target um, for people to start <coughs> spying on you. And I think just within that, and college being, or the university space being, or serving as a, a kind of like a microcosm for society, I mean, what does that then do to when we you know, come out of this space and when we start interacting with other people? And I think for me, uh, personally, it had such a scarring effect on my interactions with individuals, you know, and uh, for me to feel like one that I'm uh, being surrounded by informants or undercovers or that others are suspecting me of that, I, you know, begin to start uh, like selecting who I'll then speak to, who I'll be, uh, you know, who I'll allow myself uh, to be around and that in so many ways stunts all these opportunities that I could otherwise have. Um, and so I think one question um, that I repeatedly think about is like the utility of surveillance as a safety tool or as a measure. Um, and so dismantling this notion that spying on the Muslim community is 
a necessary sacrifice for the protection of whether it's college campuses or of society at large, and really just to think about what that means and what that entails when we allow one group, whether it's Muslims or it could be any marginalized group of uh, individuals, and when we say that it's okay to surveil on this particular group because of X, Y, and Z reason, what does that, what implications does that have on society as a whole, and where do you then draw the line? Um, so, unlike some of my older friends, I actually wasn't so personally involved with Mill. Um, I entered Brooklyn College in the fall of 2012, so um, I wasn't here when she first became involved with the Islamic Student Organization. I wasn't particularly involved with the Islamic Student Organization either. Um, you know, I would go to some events, but beyond that, my involvement wasn't that deep. Um, so for me, Mel wasn't someone who, you know, I, I knew well enough beforehand to suspect, but she, it, she was someone that upon seeing a picture of her, I was like, oh my god, I've interacted with this woman before. And where that those interactions were, were at um, Unity meetings. Um, and Unity was basically um, kind of an informal group that was comprised of um, black, Latino, Muslim students, um, where we would talk about, you know, um, uh, creating events, um, making sure our schedules like matched up all our calendars of events and all of these things. Um, and it wasn't particularly remarkable in any way, but she was at three of these meetings throughout um, 2014, so in the spring and in the fall of 2014. Um, and, you know, I, I, I just think about how unremarkable those meetings were and why they would, you know, warrant any surveillance. And it's because, you know, like for me, the only reason can possibly be that the room of students is shades of brown and black and just by virtue of that it warrants being surveilled and warrants suspicion because you know for me it felt like this is what you know people who are criminalized in this country look like and that's what that confirmed for me when I found out um, that you know that this woman who had been at three of our meetings you know was an undercover cop um, but this wasn't really uh, my first time, you know, ha dealing with surveillance. Um, when I was 15, um, I had like a, I had a Facebook status that came right after the um, Times Square, what was it, the Times Square scare. There was a bombing square in Times Square, like when I was 15, which is like maybe six years ago. And um, I wrote a status that was, probably pretty distasteful, but I didn't think it really warranted such an interrogation. Um, and it was, um, sorry sorry about the Times Square incident, I just got a little bit emotional because the naked cowboy wouldn't hug me. So it was just, it was distasteful, but it wasn't something that I would say warranted what happened, which was that um, two FBI agents came to my house, um, interrogated me. Um, they put, uh, like, our phones, they told us that they would be listening into our calls and our emails. Um, so this was like my first interaction um, with the surveillance state. And um, at this time, you know, soon after, I also had other instances of surveillance that weren't related to the NYPD, and these were more related to my uh, involvement with um, Students for Justice in Palestine. And this, this came in the form of um, basically monitoring of my social media account, which was confirmed when I would see, you know, screenshots from my, um, from my Facebook. So it was very clear that my internet, my social media could never really be private. I couldn't really use it as a place to interact with friends, family, colleagues, or per post personal things. But I had to make peace with that because, you know, at, at the very least, I could control that. And what Mel how Mel was different from this is that I couldn't really control it. So she came into a place that I thought was a safe space. I thought that these places that I was talking with friends, talking with peers, was a safe space. And to have that also, you know, that bubble was also burst there. And it really, really confirmed, you know, my feeling growing up that I was unwelcome here. And this is a feeling that you know, a lot of Muslims that I know also have just this feeling of unwelcomeness, but it, now it didn't just have to do with like slurs in the street or someone telling me go back to your country and then I could joke about and be like, you know, 
I was born at Lutheran Medical Center, you know, how am I, like, do you want me to go live over there? But, you know, that's, like, that I could joke about. It wasn't just, like, isolated incidents then. It was that the state viewed me as a criminal, not for any reason besides how I look or my name or my, you know, my religious background. So, you know, that's um, one aspect. That's that's basically the thing that it did for me, and then obviously, like learning about it, started making me rethink things again. So I was already, you know, very conscious that I was being, you know, that your phones are being tapped, that the government knows that you're all your social media, that all, you know, all of these things that I think all of us kind of relate to in some way because this is something that happens to a lot of people, you know, with the, the government monitoring of, you know, phones and the internet and all of these things, um, but it, it, it also became something personal on a personal level and I started questioning, you know, um, you know, which of my friends might be an informant, started thinking about how I met each of my friends, how much I've disclosed to each of my friends, um, you know, and uh, the same thing happened to me is that sometimes I'm sitting with my friends and we're talking about, you know, surveillance and I start wondering if maybe they suspect me and I want so desperately to prove it to them, but you can't really prove that because it's, you only really know who you are, you only really know your own intentions and that real, like, it, it just, that that's how deep it was is that you can only really know yourself and dealing with people from then on has become sort of like I have to make a concession with myself that even if this person turns out to be a cop or something, I'm going to have to allow myself to interact because otherwise I can't really be a participating member of society anymore. I just close myself off. So, you know, that's, that's really what it was for me. Um, you know, just with Mel and then with all of my other experiences with um, surveillance. I think um, this point that you had made about Mel invading a safe space. And I feel like for, for many of us who have grown up, uh, you know, being marginalized for various reasons, coming into, you know, this college campus environment, um, going into MSAs or within our various clubs that we've either founded or become, you know, participants or active participants of, those are our safe spaces. And those are sometimes the only places that we can go to and kind of let down our hair, you know, so to speak. And so for us to then find these places and then also then suspect the very people that at one point made us feel safe, that this isolation and sort of self-surveillance that ends up happening becomes sometimes our only, um, our only solution, right? And it becomes this isolation then becomes our only way to kind of feel safe. And it, it does um, create this sort of uh, fork in the road. Do we save ourselves from potentially being entrapped or potentially you know, talking to an undercover or an informant or do we go out living our everyday lives um, under this risk of then, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> wow, I mean, <clears throat> I think we uh, can hear the amazing eloquence and the uh, introspection that we have on this panel, so I think we should appreciate that. And a lot of bravery as well. Um, and what goes along with that is uh, experience. Uh, and um, Ramzi Qasim is perhaps the, one of the most important attorneys in New York City along these lines and doing work on these issues. And I would like to ask Ramzi uh, to address what we've, been, what we've been hearing from the legal point of view. What even, what, why, why do the NYPD believe that they can even do such things? Um, well, I'd like to first thank um, everyone for coming out. Um, and I'm, I'm honored to be on this panel. Uh, I'm, I'm really humbled by the courageous interventions of my co-panelists so far, and I'd like to thank Mustafa for organizing this important panel. Um, you know, I think we, my organization, CLEAR, which, uh, which is a group uh, that is really focused on the different ways in which law enforcement agencies have been trying to play a role in so-called counterterrorism. Uh, is a group that's composed of mainly second and third year law students at CUNY Law School. And we started uh, with a core group of students in 2009. Um, and our idea really was to, was to represent people because we knew that there was a huge area of unmet need. We knew that a lot of individuals were being approached for questioning by the NYPD, by the FBI, not about any particular crimes, but to be asked questions about what was going on at their mosques, what the Imam was saying during Friday's sermon, what they thought about the Arab Spring. And because these people were not being charged with a crime, they weren't entitled 
to a court-appointed lawyer. And a lot of times they would engage, they would submit to interrogation without a lawyer present. And so the students and I thought, well, here's an area that we can you know, fit into and we can provide that legal representation free of charge. Uh, shortly after you know, our first few meetings, there was a huge series of FBI raids in, in Flushing, which was where CUNY Law School used to be. Now it's in Long Island City. Uh, but it was basically in our backyard, uh, targeting the, uh, a fairly large Afghan community there. And so we were sort of thrust into action there. And what we started seeing in those first two years of the project's ex existence is, you know, I'd meet with students after their meetings with clients, and they'd say, uh, you know, they'd say, well, something odd came up. Um, you know, they'd have a client who maybe was taken into to a precinct uh, on a traffic violation, right, a moving violation, or something minor of that nature. And then they'd be taken to a separate room, and they'd be questioned by plain clothes detectives who wouldn't identify themselves. And they'd be questioned about things completely unrelated to the violations, the traffic violation, whatever, whatever the offense was that brought them to the precinct in the first place. They'd be questioned about what community they came from, who they knew, uh, what they could tell about you know, the board at the mosque or the community center that they were members of, where they lived, who they knew, what their neighbors where their neighbors came from, what their immigration status was. So questions that had nothing to do with you know, the reasons that brought them to the precinct in the first place. So my students and I, you know, we were wondering what, what this was about. Um, and in 2011, finally, when, when the Associated Press revealed a whole bunch of previously secret NYPD you know, police records, uh, we got confirmation of what we had started to see, you know, connecting the dots between our different cases at CLEAR. And I say confirmation deliberately because I think um, I know that for a large segment of the public, when those stories broke and when those documents became public, uh, you know, it was pretty much a revelation that this was going on. But for members of targeted communities here in New York City, uh, it wasn't a revelation. It was really a confirmation of what they had known or had suspected for years since 9-11, uh, which is that the police, and not just the police, uh, the FBI, Homeland Security Investigations, a host of police agencies engaging in like sweeping surveillance, over policing of a particular community identified along religious and ethnic lines. So it was confirmation for, for those communities. I mean, obviously it was shocking confirmation because you know, a lot of those documents showed, you know, there were police files on restaurants, bookshops, like every aspect of Muslim public life in New York City was logged, Gestapo style, and kept at a database in Brooklyn that was controlled by the police department. They went into MSAs, Muslim Student Organizations, uh, Muslim Student Associations. We, we saw that ourselves in the CUNY system. Um, you know, because after, after these reports came out, you have to remember that the police and the mayor at the time very aggressively said, hey, no harm, no foul, no one's being hurt here, surveillance <coughs> is harmless, and it's also lawful, it's also constitutional. So a bunch of community-based organizations asked us a clear to, to respond to those two claims, that it was harmless and that it was lawful. Um, and as, as you've heard uh, you know, from, from Sarah and Rabia, obviously surveillance is not harmless. Um, but what we, what we did, what the students in CLEAR did after community-based organizations asked us to do it, was we went around, we interviewed dozens of individuals who had been affected by the different aspects of NYPD surveillance. And when you think about what happened to my co-panelists with the informant, that's just, sorry, with the undercover, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There were various other aspects to this sprawling NYPD surveillance program. And what the students did is they wrote a report called Mapping Muslims that really substantiates the, the myriad expressions of surveillance and the very real devastating effect that surveillance has on communities, how disruptive it can be. And you've heard it um, you know, from, from Sarah and Rabia, so I don't need to repeat it, but the chilling effect is real, uh, the stigma is real, the fear that it instills in communities, uh, the paralysis that it causes in terms of organizing and activism, all of those things are real, measurable, concrete. Um, and I'll just give you one example you know, the students uh, at the law school who were in clear, uh, who were doing some of these interviews, went into the office of a Muslim student association at one of the CUNY undergraduate campuses, not this one. Uh, I believe it was Hunter or Baruch. Um, and what they saw on the wall was a sign that said, please refrain from political conversations in the MSA. I, I challenge you to, to name any other, you know, student organization that has a sign like that on its wall. Um, 
And that to us was the clearest illustration of the chilling effect of surveillance. That because of uh, you know, what they now had confirmed, uh, these students wanted to refrain from the most basic thing, the thing you would expect them to do in college, which is learn how to be organizers, experiment with uh, ideas, even radical ideas. Uh, that's what college is supposed to be for. And, and here you had an entire generation of Muslim American activists and organizers and leaders in the making who were not getting that sort of training in college, uh, depriving their communities of their services, you know, going years into the future and depriving society of lar at large of, 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 of their presence and their role. The other thing we did, uh, again, at the request of, uh, you know, community-based organizations was we, uh, we researched a possible lawsuit uh, to answer the claim by the city that surveillance was constitutional and lawful. Uh, so the, the students at CLEAR started researching different legal theories. We brought in allies uh, from the American Civil Liberties Union, the New York Civil Liberties Union, and ultimately we filed a lawsuit on behalf of a number of individual uh, and institutional plaintiffs, mosques and charitable organizations. And that lawsuit uh, is titled the Raza v. City of New York, and it's a lawsuit that basically uh, claimed that the NYPD surveillance program um, was a violation of the constitutional rights of the plaintiffs who were all originally clear clients and partners. Uh, because it violated their First Amendment rights under the U.S. Constitution, and it violated their right to equal protection under the laws because the NYPD was policing or over-policing Muslim communities in ways that it was not, uh, you know, scrutinizing other communities in the city and beyond. Uh, so that lawsuit was filed in 2013. Uh, it went through different procedural stages. And in January of this year, we announced a proposed settlement to the lawsuit uh, that, that should impose additional safeguards and restraints on uh, the police department that were not in place uh, up until now. That lawsuit is, uh, you know, the, the settlement has not been approved by the court yet. There's going to be a public hearing that's open to all of you and any other members of the public uh, so you can come and express support for or opposition to uh, the terms of the proposed settlement before the, the judge decides whether or not to approve it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> We could take this in a couple of different directions. Like, for one thing, we could talk about the, the history of this kind of surveillance as well, right? I mean, there have been, there have been uh, past uh, uh, efforts of the NYPD to spy on various communities. Um, uh, and then there was even, um, uh, there, were, there were guidelines that were established that were, that were attempts to limit that kind of surveillance. Uh, anybody want to tackle that on the panel? About yeah, I can, sure. I can just weigh in real quick. So, I mean, the background here, obviously, none of this is new, right? We, I mean, the over-policing of communities of color or minority communities is, uh, predates 9-11, uh, exists today, obviously, with a host of other communities. And when you think about it in a, in a general way, really, uh, policies like stop and frisk and Muslim surveillance are far more closely related than they are different. They both stem from, like, flawed preventive uh, policing uh, ideas. So, you know, the, the ideology that underpins stop and frisk is broken windows, right? And that's premised on the notion that if you, if you uh, police minor misconduct, you're going to prevent more major offenses. And the assumption there is that someone who breaks a window is inevitably going to eventually commit a felony, right? Uh, and, and so when you look at Muslim surveillance, the, under, the underlying ideology there is something called radicalization theory. Uh, radicalization theory is the idea that there's this conveyor belt that goes from increased religiosity, you know, stopping smoking, growing a beard, putting on a hijab, that takes you inev inevitably towards political violence, an act of terrorism, or so-called terrorism. Um, there's no social scientific support for either one of these theories, uh, and in fact, there's a lot of social scientific support that debunks both of these theories, but the police department here in New York and in some other cities have all the same used these theories to build policies that they have then applied. So the policies are stop and frisk on the one hand, Muslim surveillance on the other. All you know, premised on this notion of prevention. Um, so you know, all of these ideas are 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 not are not new. The idea that communities of color are going to be over policed that's that's happened throughout American history and before the NYPD itself had a whole bunch of red squads 
uh, in the early 20th century to go after Italian anarchists and Jewish American communists and labor activists. And then there was the COINTELPRO federal program targeting the Black Panthers and civil rights organizations nationwide. Um, there was a very interesting documentary that was also aired on PBS about the Black Panthers that I would suggest uh, that everyone watch if you want to see the role of the FBI and how deliberately it went about seeding informants, specifically in uh, organizations like Unity, right, uh, where, where, where the goal is to form cross-cutting alliances, which were seen as particularly politically threatening to the FBI, uh, all with the, with the goal of like, disrupting that sort of organizing and creating a climate of fear and paranoia. In many ways, that is the goal. Um, so, so, you know, those things are not new. One thing that came out of the, uh, the, the sort of Vietnam War moment were the Hanshu rules. Uh, there, were, there were a bunch of anti-war organizations active in New York City. They became subject to police surveillance. A number of them organized and filed what became a class action lawsuit, the Hanshu lawsuit. So it's a very old lawsuit. It goes back four decades. And one result of that lawsuit was the imposition of guidelines, the, the Hanshu rules, on the police department's ability to monitor political activities here in New York City. Um, those guidelines were uh, unique at the time. Uh, but then when 9-11 happened, the police department went back in, actually, the, one of the key architects of the NYPD's surveillance program, David Cohen, who was a former CIA officer who was brought into the NYPD after 9-11 and started their Muslim surveillance program here, uh, filed a declaration with the federal court overseeing the Hanshu rules and saying, look, 9-11 happened, everything has changed. Uh, these rules are making our jobs impossible. They're making the city less safe. And as a result of that, the court watered down the Hanshu rules took away a lot of the oversight <coughs> mechanisms that existed, uh, civilian oversight mechanisms that, were, that existed within the police department were taken away, in addition to a bunch of other protections. As a result, the NYPD was able to roll out this surveillance program, the consequences of which you've heard about directly from Rabia um, and, 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 and Sarah and myself. Um, so those Hanshu rules now are going to be, if this settlement is approved, they are going to be strengthened again uh, brought back closer to where they were before 9-11. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if Aviva could also talk about the uh, reception that your article has generated uh, and also what, it, what reaction it elicited from, um, from QD. Sure. I mean, I think it's fair to say the article was pretty uh, widely read. I think one thing that uh, I think one important thing about the article is that um, it reminded everybody that um, surveillance and infiltration of Muslim communities hasn't ended, and that de Blasio shutting down the demographics unit also doesn't change the fact that there are still informants and undercover cops in Muslim communities actually like doesn't do anything to stop that. Um, and yeah, that the double de Blasio administration um, hasn't, uh, though it's, yeah, I suppose that the de Blasio administration hasn't taken as strong a stance as strong a stance on these issues as you might think he has. Um, so I think that's one really important thing to stress about the article is that uh, kind of after the AP reporting and after de Blasio's election, some people were under the impression that things had changed, but actually they haven't. <laughs> um, I think, sure, I'll talk about the response from CUNY. Um, I mean, I think one important thing to remember is that, yeah, as we discussed in September, I think it was September 2011 when it was revealed that there was an undercover cop at Brooklyn College, right? So after that, President Gould, is she still the president here? Yeah, okay. She condemned, quote, the alleged intrusion of NYPD, of the NYPD onto campus life, um, which sort of suggests that she was against it or had some feelings about it. I don't know. She said she was surprised by it, that she didn't know that this could happen. Um, when I contacted the communications office to ask them if Brooklyn College in the interim years from 2011 to 2015 had ever sat down with the NYPD to be like, hey, please don't do that. They just, they said no, that they'd never actually had conversations with the NYPD about this. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the chancellor and the chancellor's office have been pretty much un unwilling to come out against what happened. Um, they've been uh, totally resistant to student and faculty organizing, uh, kind of saying that the chancellor should comment. They haven't, chancellor hasn't responded at all to petitions or faculty requests for meetings or um, anything like that. And um, one point I made in my article, which is that there is a, memorum, a memorandum of understanding with NYPD that 
The aren't supposed to be police on campus unless the administration's notified. Um, the chancellor at their chancellor's office basically said that only applies to events, not undercover informants, and we would never expect the NYBD to in disclose that kind of information to us. So I think, yeah, the, the chancellor's office and CUNY more generally has basically said, like, this isn't our problem, we wash our hands of this. What the NYPD does on, on college campuses is, uh, comes on, falls under the handshoe guidelines, and if the NYPD says they're following handshoe, then I guess they are. Um, so I think there's that, but I think one other thing to remember is that, um, you know, Chancellor Milliken <laughs> has certainly come out in other contexts to talk about these issues. I don't know if you guys followed kind of what happened, uh, was it at Hunter College, mm -hmm. with kind of allegations of anti-Semitism in November, um, kind of around BDS activism and kind of the safety, whether it was creating an unsafe climate for Jewish students on campus. I think whatever you think about that, about the question of BDS and unsafe spaces for Jewish students or whatever, it's certainly true that the chancellor came out and talked about that, talked about the fact that Jewish, Jewish students felt unsafe and that free speech is important, but that it's also important for people to feel safe and to respect each other and whatever. Um, and I think it's really telling that he has never said anything about how like these students have been affected in these really real and tangible ways. Um, and, uh, Something else to say. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it speaks to a lot also what Rabia was saying about the fact that Muslims are supposed to um, carry the burden of keeping New York or the US safe, right? So uh, we need surveillance to keep us safe. And, you know, if, if, if Muslims aren't doing anything wrong, then they should be okay with it. Actually, you know, the implication is that it's their patriotic duty to kind of put up with this spying and with the undercover cops because of, because of the threat of terrorist attacks. And I think that's sort of mimicked in the fact that um, the CUNY administration is uh, so resistant to saying anything at all about what happened. Um, yeah, I, I think that um, like two things. One, this, um, this question of, you know, you shouldn't have anything to fear if you have nothing to hide is one of the things that even though, you know, like, you know, in college I've taken a lot of courses that have to do with um, the civil rights movement and black power movement and, you know, I've been lear alongside being spied, I've been learning about NYPD spying, but still had a sense that, you know, it wouldn't happen to me because there was this whole thing of if you're not doing anything wrong and I felt like I wasn't doing anything wrong that would warrant spying. So, so even with all of the historical examples and all of that, this idea makes it surprising every time, it makes it shocking every time. Um, and then as far as like, um, you know, the lack of uh, administrative response, um, in the spring of 2015, um, Pamela Geller was on this campus and, you know, there was a, a student disruption of her event. But, you know, what happened afterwards is that she, um, she posted pictures of Muslim students on her website um, and links to their Twitters and, you know, other uh, social media and we started getting, you know, pictures of severed heads and death threats and things like that and, you know, we started feeling very insecure and I requested to have um, a meeting with the president at that time. And, you know, since the meeting was about the security of Muslim students, I thought I would also bring up, at the time there wasn't anything released yet, but we had known already that Mel was an undercover cop and I thought I'd bring it up. And it was the same thing that he, that you said happened in 2011 was what was said is that if there is, we don't know about it. Do you know how dangerous making a claim like that is? You can't make a claim like that without any backup. So, you know, it kind of made me second guess like the evidence that I had and made me feel like they thought I was lying um, or that they, they questioned it. Or in, in any case, if it did exist, they didn't know anything about it and couldn't be held responsible or accountable for that. And since then, I do know that there was like something in the minutes of a meeting where President Gould condemned the NYPD spying, but this was a closed meeting and this was in the minutes of the meeting. Um, there hasn't been, you know, even though there's been like Twitter campaigns and all these things, you know, at uh, Milliken, at uh, Chancellor Milliken at the president of Brooklyn College asking for open condemnation. There hasn't been one. And, you know, on the same campus that every semester there are emails sent out about, um, you know, 
about issues of um, perceived anti-Semitism and, uh, you know, and, and urging the campus to remain civil and to, and for, for people to, for, for the campus to be open and, and secure for all students, there hasn't been the same response for issues that have been brought up constantly to administration here. So it, it, it goes beyond just the Twitter thing. It's like in-person meetings that still have not um, been responded to. Um, and, and the response has always been one that washes um, administration CUNY of any accountability for it or any responsibility to its Muslim students. I mean, I think one thing I'll add is that um, I think one thing, I don't know if it was Professor Bayou who said it to me in an interview in the pastor, uh, who it was, but someone pointed out to me in the course of researching the story that after the AP story came out, I mean, there were also private universities, Yale and Brown and some others, where there were undercover cops who were attending like raft trips and kind of other MSA events. And for a lot of the kind of elite Ivies, their, their administrations did come out like very strongly against what had happened, right? and made much stronger statements about the need for their Muslim students to feel safe. So I think it's kind of telling, I, then the person who I spoke to, was it actually yeah, you said this? Um, do you wanna actually <laughs> say what you said on the phone? I don't, I don't really remember the details. <laughs> but uh, I think it was uh, Princeton. Yeah. The, pr the president of Princeton issued a letter right away mm -hmm. that was condemning this, uh, this activity. Um, it, and, uh, uh, where are we going oh, I guess like, I was just going to say that I think it's important that, like in the public university context, a place as diverse as Brooklyn College, a system as important as CUNY to like the lives of working class students, students of color, students who don't have access to private institutions, that um, are, that you're that this inst that, like the people who run these institutions don't care about um, protecting the diversity of their student body, and that it's actually in elite private institutions that the administrations are willing or feel able, I guess, to uh, say what. They did. Right. They have a certain kind of like, you know, cap cultural capital that, that gives them a certain that, an autonomy to be political as if, uh, you know, it, it operates along those lines, which of course it shouldn't operate on at all. We should be, we should have exactly those same rights uh, and, and uh, opportunities at a, at a, uh, at, a uh, at a state school or a, a city university like this. Um, so this is all this is all fabulous and really important, and I want to make sure that we leave at least a little bit of time for some response from the audience. And so let's let's take a few questions and then and then get some response because we're already running out of time. Really. Yeah, I just have a quick question about the, the legal, the public and private. That's really what was interesting to me. This idea, of, you know, this is a public university, but we have gates also. It's not you know you can't right. come in and out. It's not a free entry, although it's public property, right? It's public property as far as I know. Okay, unless a foundation or something, but most of so the question is about the, from 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 the, the lawyer, the law inspector. Um, he, are can the legally can they come on campuses that are private and do this? I mean that that's really my question. I mean can they are has spot, is there a difference a legal aspect between spying on public campuses and spying on private campuses? Okay, let's let's also try to take a few just so we get enough voices. Uh, People, other people have questions too. I know Jocelyn has one. Um, well, I first and foremost want to thank you for your eloquence, uh, your courage, and especially your activism. It's really important that we have this conversation. My question for any one of you who might want to respond <clears throat> is what, what do you think we should be doing on our campus um, to encourage deeper discussions and better understanding of the plight that vulnerable students face? I, I think so. It would be really nice if we could hear from you because I'm sure you've thought about it. And one more over here. Yes, ma'am. Um, we'll start of kind of continuing on what she said. Um, I, I grew up in the Midwest, in Indiana, in a very small town uh, where there's lack of diversity uh, and very conservative ideas. And a lot of their ideas are driven by fear. Um, so I guess my question is, and sort of instead of having this invasive surveillance and it's not necessarily the answer how do you how do you create a more positive manner for for national security one that's not fueled by fear of not understanding a culture different from your own I'm just the moderate. <laughs> <laughs> um, as far as the question about what we can do on campus, I feel like for many of us, um, 
sometimes I feel like I know I know what's happening, but like other people may not be familiar, other Muslim students may not even be familiar with um, the details of the surveillance, although they may have fears that it's happening. Um, so just creating those conversations from like the get-go, I think um, having like this kind of confidentiality, like what happens within a classroom environment is a safe space. It should be a safe space. It shouldn't be, it, you shouldn't be held accountable for what you say or what you think out loud within, you know, within a university environment, because that is a space which harbors, you know, difficult conversations, difficult ideas, controversial ideas, and, and I feel like if, if you do have, you know, in quotes, problematic ideas, whatever that may be, um, how are you going to hone in on these ideas if that safe space isn't created for you to even have those conversations to begin with? And I, I feel like having an event like this and creating regular conversations like this on campus is just the first step. Um, but also having, you know, President Gould or whoever may be, you know, leading this institution to come out and condemn these things, whether or not uh, these people in positions of power actually have the ability um, to stop the surveillance, just knowing that the surveillance is being acknowledged and condemned in and of itself creates like security just for us. Because I remember when the AP reports came out, um, President Gould and many uh, many members of the administration kind of said, as a matter of fact, like, yeah, I guess it happened before, but it no longer happens. And so they were denying the experiences that we were having in those very moments. And so I feel like just having that um, is helpful. Yeah, I just want uh, just a point of reference for that. Um, that President Gould saying yes, she agreed, she condemned. Uh, that took place at, in a faculty council meeting, which is an uh, open open law meeting, right? So anybody can attend. Uh, and uh, faculty had brought a resolution forward condemning the spying on campus, and uh, it passed unanimously uh, at faculty council. And so it would be in the minutes of faculty council, and it was at that meeting, which wasn't. It's, there are minutes of it where she said uh, absolutely she agreed and that uh, this was awful and she also said and it's done. So moving forward, we don't, if, the fact of her, what she said was we don't have to worry about this anymore because we have acknowledged it, but there was never a public yeah. statement made. Right, and that's a, big, that's a big difference too. That's an important difference. Ramsey, do you want to address the uh, public yeah. private? Yeah, I mean, I'll say it doesn't uh, actually make a legal difference whether it's a public or a private campus. And certainly the NYPD, we've all heard them say that what they've done, and obviously, I mean, what, what culprit, what government agency fesses up immediately to its wrongdoing, right? That never happens. So obviously the police department is going to say it's legal, it's compliant with the Hanshu rules, it's compliant with the Constitution. They're going to say all of those things, uh, but we, you know, I think I'm not the only one who happens to disagree um, and uh, in terms of whether it was compliant with the Hanshu rules, whether it was compliant with the Constitution. And just because they may, you know, in theory, have the ability to go onto a campus, private or public, uh, doesn't mean that they have the ability to, uh, just in a blanket fashion, penetrate and conduct surveillance in various protected spaces. And so those are the kinds of restrictions that, you know, we were trying to impose through uh, through the settlement that we uh, worked out with the city. I will say, I mean, I think the, the, the administration, the, the CUNY, CUNY's administration as a whole, uh, their response uh, throughout, um, you know, these confirmations, revelations, whatever you want to call them, all the way up to and including this latest round with the, with the stories that Aviva wrote about the informant here on Brooklyn College, I mean, that, it's been really shameful. I mean, it's just an abdication of any responsibility. Uh, they've just completely, as Aviva said, washed their hands of the entire thing, washed their hands of, of their students. And, uh, and you know, as Rabia is saying, I, I think it would be fairly easy for the administration to say instead, uh, you know, to recognize the impact that this has had on students and to express some concern for, for the members of our community who have been directly affected. I think, unfortunately, the, the administration at CUNY Central is banking on some faulty notion that Muslim students are too isolated and disorganized and that non-Muslim students are not going to care uh, about what happens to Muslim students. I think they're mistaken. Uh, I know that right now there is an effort afoot uh, to get some additional resolutions passed, both by different student bodies as well as by faculty bodies, and it is hopefully going to culminate in another push to put pressure on the Chancellor's office to, to make a more responsible uh, statement because the statement that was put out was just, uh, you know, laughable if it weren't uh, really saddening. Um, uh, sorry, 
Um, I was just going to address your um, question about um, national security, and you know, I think within within U.S. borders, um, the answer is definitely not criminalizing or over policing um, student like certain groups of people. I think education does way more in reducing fear and all of these misconceptions than than having people over policed and surveilled ever will. And you know, this is like really broad, but you know, I think that if you want your borders secure, you should maybe just stop blanket bombing all of these places all over the world, you know? You know, that would be <laughs> so, that's about it. <laughs> Um, I think also speaking to the question of fear, um, and kind of also doing this work as a journalist, I mean, one thing I have never really spoken about is just actually how hard it was to get the initial Gothamist story published. When the story was first kind of fell into my hands, I thought, like, it would be really easy to place because it's so explosive and it was revelations that had never, ever been written about. But it, it's, the, it's the story that I've had the hardest time placing in my career. And I, had, I think I walked away for or had, was rejected from, I think, maybe four or five outlets before Gothamist finally agreed to work with me. And, you know, my experience with Gothamist was amazing, so I'm actually really happy with how it turned out. But um, there was a lot of indifference and there, was, there were a lot of dis conflicts with outlets about how to tell the story. Um, and about, for me, it was really important to frame the narratives of the women who experienced the surveillance and what it felt like, what it meant to them, and to humanize, um, humanize their experiences, right? To make, to make it real, to make the fear they experienced real. And a lot of outlets, um, we had a lot of tensions with a lot of outlets about that. Um, so I think if you, I think fear also comes from the way that the mainstream media and even relatively progressive outlets cover this issue and the really dearth of Muslim voices and humanizing voices in the mainstream media to talk about this issue. Um, and I think that if we're gonna create a different kind of conversation, which seems sort of even a ridiculous idea given the way the primaries are going, but um, you know, I think it's really important that we push back against, um, yeah, against what's happening in, in the mainstream media and really demand different kinds of stories and demand more space for like voices like these to talk about what they've experienced. And then <clears throat> incidentally too, following the, uh, the Paris and then the immediately after that the San Bernardino shootings, I believe it was the police commissioner then said that he's going to ramp up the surveillance all over again. Um, so. Uh, Yes, please. So I, I did want to make a plug for, you know, for those of you who, who are curious about, like, your rights if you are approached or if you know someone who's approached for questioning or if you suspect, as many people in different communities do, that there may be an undercover or an informant in your midst. Uh, the students at Clear over the years have written up pamphlets on these subjects and they've revised them and refined them. There's a bunch of them on a table right outside this auditorium. I would encourage you to pick them up, hand them out, uh, and for those of you who are interested in, like, doing this work, I would encourage you to come to, to CUNY where we graduate only social justice oriented lawyers. I think we need more lawyers doing this kind of work. So if you're interested in law school, pick up some of those materials as well. When we had uh, meetings about stop and frisk a couple of years ago, we were all, or well, many of us, were kind of shocked to find out that when someone was stopped, uh, the, the the incident was recorded and became a permanent civil disability for the person involved, even though that person was never charged, let alone convicted or processed in any way. Um, is something, I mean, you made the analogy, I wonder if the analogy goes this far. If people are reported on in this way, does it create a civil disability for them? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. I mean, I think for in the stop and frisk context, it really depends on how the incident ends. But let's assume it doesn't end with that kind of a record that haunts someone for the rest of their life. It's still bad enough to have to, right? I'm not saying that it is. No, no, I know. see the psychological effects. The psychological, social. But, but also the real world effects right. that keep people from getting jobs. And, you know, that right. So I think, I think on the surveillance side, uh, you know, the records that are being created about businesses, about uh, student organizations, about individuals, you know, those records were previously secret records. Now, some of them have been made public. Some of them have been leaked and made public. And if you go on the Associated Press's website, you can find hundreds of pages of these previously secret police records. Part of the issue is that whether or not they're secret, 
you know, do we want to live in a society where the police has compiled these records on activities that have nothing to do with criminal conduct, right? It's, it's what you would imagine the Stasi would do. It's not what you would imagine the NYPD would do. Uh, although, again, there's a long history of the NYPD doing just that. Uh, so, so I think that's the, the real question. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't come back to haunt you in, in that kind of way um, because, because those records are not you know, public records that are shared with different agencies. <clears throat> Although I should just add too that uh, um, there have been several uh, um, studies around employment discrimination over the last several years, mm -hmm. and they find that employment discrimination is very highly pronounced against Muslim candidates right now. So I think that also, you know, probably maybe it's not you specifically, but people don't want to get hired because it works, yeah, it works out like even, even more racist on yeah. that level. Right? Yeah. So, but. Uh, I, I shouldn't have had the last word, but I want to really thank this amazing panel and thank you all for coming. Thank you.